I'm going to take a natural textured object like this fur bow and use two-part silicone mold making putty to make this wicked cool sterling silver cast ring. Texture bands are some of my most popular uh, rings that I sell at shows and um, I love making textured bands from natural impressions like this is a palm frond, a leaf of a palm palm tree, this is an impression of granite, this is an impression of fir bough. Uh, like a Christmas tree branch. This is a seashell. This is a lemon peel or citrus peel. And this is a sea urchin. Um, this is a package from Rio Grande. This is, I mean, this is a jewelry supply company in New Mexico. And I've used them for years. And they make this product. I think they make it. Or at least they sell this product that is wonderful. I reached out to them. I said, hey, I'll make a YouTube video of how to use this product and share it on the internet and um, in exchange for you sending me a couple of uh, sets of it. So they're not paying me to do this, but they're giving me this material um, to work with for free. So anyway, this is what I got from them. Awesome, cool stickers. Nice, very nice, cool. And this is the stuff right here. Oh, it does have their name on it. So I guess they do make it or they, they repackage it or whatever, but. So they call it mold compound, cold mold compound. So it's uh, platinum cure silicone mold putty. So I use this, it's a two part putty that you mix together in your hands and then you can go out and you can collect textures with it. That's what I use it for in jewelry and it's a really important part of my process actually. Let's see what it looks like. Oh yeah, okay. It's the packaging has changed since the last set that I got. Oh yeah, so we got this white sticky substance and a purple sticky substance. Let's start in the studio here and just go over a few kind of how to work with this material before we head outside. We've got a lemon here with kind of a rough texture, so we'll start with that. Working with this stuff is actually pretty simple. You, It's a one-to-one -one ratio, which means you need two equal-sized blobs of this material, and I just eyeball it. I'm, I look pretty close. I'm pretty stingy with it. Uh, obviously, the smaller amount you work with, the longer it will last. You notice that I got a little bit of the white uh, first compound in the container of the second one, which I think is probably not a good idea. It may actually harden up inside the container, so whenever that happens, I take care to kind of pick it out. But um, after you, you do that, you want to make sure you don't mix your lids up here if you uh, do that the same thing you may have a premature hardening pro problem uh, with the two but so now we mix the two together knead the two blobs together until they <clears throat> make a kind of a homogeneous um, kind of a light purple color and you really want to mix it pretty thoroughly uh, so that you don't have any issues um, with the things not curing later on. All of the different sets of this two-part silicone mold making putty that I've used in the past uh, has has had very short working times, like three or four minutes. Uh, set things setting up in as quickly as you know four or five minutes. So um, this stuff, after working with it on a number of different um, applications, has a 60-minute working time. So. I don't know if that's a fluke or if they designed it. Actually, on the label, it says that it has a much shorter working time than what I actually discovered to be true. So uh, who knows what that's about. But So now you need to be thinking about what are you going to do with this um, mold making, this mold once you have it. I'm going to make silver rings. I want to make waxes off of this, um, off this mold. So I want to make strips, strips of long texture that are at least a little bit longer than the longest ring that I would want to make. So uh, keep that in mind. So here I am behind the studio collecting some uh, textures off of uh, some plants and some other interesting things that I found out back here. These plants are wet from a recent rain. It doesn't seem to affect the product at all. I found a, uh, a polypore mushroom here. It may be turkey tail, but it's not quite as colorful as I'm used to seeing. But it has little pores, little holes on the bottom where the spores come out as opposed to gills. Peel that off too. Ooh.
Wow. Okay, so for this uh, texture collecting session, I got some good stuff. This is like turkey tail mushrooms, uh, lemon peel, the Bose speaker. Um, so this, these are some uh, mushrooms, bracket mushrooms that were still growing. I did them right on the dead tree. Uh, beech leaf, fir bough, wood grain. These two are lichen and a cedar. I included this clip in the studio uh, because it illustrates how well this material works on human-made um, things like this llama toy as well. So I use this in my process and it works great. So now we have these cool uh, silicone molds. What do we do with them? So I'm going to show you two different ways to work with this mold material once you collect it, make it. Uh, the first one here is painting melted wax onto the molds. Uh, here I have a rather crude setup, which is an old electric frying pan with water in it, uh, basically creating a double boiler. And then I have a stainless pot that I found at the dump with wax in it. And so I've, I'm using this double boiler to keep that wax liquid, molten, and I'm just painting it on. The problem that I have with this process right here. This is actually really effective, but what you, the biggest challenge that you will have in doing it like I'm doing here is uh, air bubbles. Air bubbles get trapped down in the deeper parts of the mold and you won't get a complete cast. I have since purchased a whack, electric wax melter, which they use for like hair removal, for like doing Brazilians and stuff. On Amazon, it was $30. It's digitally, uh, you can digitally set the temperature on it, which is much nicer. You don't have to kind of monitor it. The water in this frying pan uh, evaporates pretty quickly. You have to keep refreshing it and it's kind of a pain. So this is a cheap alternative uh, for $30. You can have a, a better one. The wax I'm using in this pot, by the way, is basically reject injection wax, sheet wax, sticky wax, paraffin, beeswax, and whatever I had laying around. The thickness of the wax that you're applying is really important. You need to be thinking about how thick you want your finished silver piece to be as to how thick you apply that wax. Now, once you've got the right thickness uh, on, on them, the, they peel off very easily from the silicone molds, by the way. Uh, next thing I do is I put them in a warm water bath. Now, I found that 122 degrees is the ideal working temperature for wax like this. It doesn't melt it, but it softens it up. And if I were to cut this uh, to trim this piece up without warming it, it would crack. I would fracture it. So that's why I warm it here. So I'm using a rotary cutter on a rotary cutter mat um, and trimming them down to close to the width of the finished ring that I want to have. I'm, I'm cutting them wider than I want, a little bit wider because I can always remove material later on after it's cast. But um, And then I flattened it out with the heel of my hand, which I'm not showing here. Next, I'm warming the pieces that which I've cut to length. I'm making size 11 rings here. So I have a size 11 um, metal mandrel there and I and I warm the wax up. I wrap it around and then just tack it with my wax pen. I'm using sticky wax to connect the two sides together. Much better way than using the parent wax that's there. That sticky wax is amazing stuff. Um, so I just tack them in place first and then I take them to my other wax bench where I have uh, additional wax pens and I um, do a really careful job under magnification of making sure that I have a strong joint on the inside and the outside and the two edges. I'm examining the joint where the two ends of the piece come together and looking for exactly that. You want the, um, the blob of wax that connects the two together to be slightly proud of the surface. So it's a little bit higher. It's way easier to remove material later on, remove uh, silver if you have too much than it is to try and fill it in with solder. That's a pain in the butt. When I do these kinds of textures, collect these textures and make rings, I might make like a dozen of them. And in the end, um, the keepers that I'm really happy with, I might get three or four at the very end. So um, you just need to accept that there's going to be a lot of loss in that. And of course, the nice thing is that all the wax that you've used can just get melted down and start again, and you can start again. All right, so here's another, an alternate method of working with silicone mold putty um, to pouring liquid melted wax on top of these um, putty impressions here 
you can use base plate wax. So base plate wax is something that's from the uh, dental industry. A base plate is something to do with they make impressions of, the, of a mouth and then they cast things like retainers and stuff. Um, and this, they sell this stuff and this is, um, I think it's generally you can find this stuff cheaper than you can from jewelry supply places. So it's dental supply base plate wax. This, I got like 10 block boxes from China uh, about five years ago. Um, this stuff is great. And like I said, it's inexpensive. So I'm gonna start by, um, actually I'm gonna start by getting my water warmed up. So I'm looking for um, a, I have a little mini crock pot here and I've attached it to my rheostat and my rheostat um, is set so that my water will be in the neighborhood of 122 degrees. So 122 is what I found to be the most useful generic um, temperature um, to work with that will is not too hot so that it will melt the wax. You do not want to melt the wax. You just want to soften it so that when you make an impression, it will um, it will mold and, and fit to the textures that you have. So um, I've got my water set up here. It's actually like 129 right now, but you want to your target is 122. You have to kind of tweak it every time you open the lid, drops a little bit. So um, just kind of the neighborhood is of 122 is what you're looking for. So the next thing I'm going to do, I think I'm going to um, make some uh, impressions for rings. And so I'm going to uh, just cut these straight across in strips and I'm going to cut them wider than I want the rings to be because I can always trim them down later. I'd much rather have too much texture than too little. And I'm just going to zip some of these off. Now the nice thing about using uh, water that's the right temperature is at 122 degrees is they will not uh, melt so I can just toss them in here and I can leave them in there for 10 minutes and they're not going to fall apart or melt because the water is not too hot. So here's one, uh, here's a texture from uh, uh, Key West I made when I was in Key West. I think it's a texture of the bark of a palm, uh, palm tree. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, yeah, you have to work really quickly. My hands are freezing cold right now. It's snowing outside. So um, I'm going to warm them up in this water a little bit to get them a little bit warmer. And you have like just one or two seconds to bring the wax over, lay it on top, and then I use the heel of my hand here and just press that into this. Let's see how this goes. First one. Lay it down. And there it is. There's the texture. I just actually, so now actually it's, I think it's still probably warm enough that I can just flatten it. There we go. That's a good, that's a good looking texture. So I'll set that aside. Now for every, you know, one keeper that I get, uh, well, every texture that I make that's a really good one, I probably make four or five that aren't, that aren't so good. So don't get stressed about that. That's why I like uh, look shopping for the cheap stuff, the inexpensive waxes, so that I can do lots of experimenting. Well, that's a cool one too. This one does not have a name on it. So this is one inch styrofoam insulation, and that kind of acts like your hand. That'll work, maybe. And we'll try that on here. So the idea is that I'm going to put the wax on here and then press with this and hopefully I can get a longer, a better press than the short section of my palm. Okay. Boom and boom. That's a little bit better, actually. Okay, and these are pretty successful, pretty deep textures. This is a casting tree that's all sprued up. So all those individual models of those textured um, strips of wax have now been formed into a circle and sprued up. They have a little uh, piece of what, stem of wax that connects them to that main blue stem there called the sprue. And these are ready to be cast in my casting machines. Okay, so the uh, wax models have now been treed up and placed inside a flask, a metal flask. And now I'm going to mix up and um, pour some investment, which is basically a high temperature plaster. 
uh, into these flasks. Uh, that plaster is already that investment has already been vacuumed once to eliminate some of the air bubbles. And now I fill these flasks very carefully by pouring the plaster down the side so I don't knock any of the models off the tree. And now I place them in the vacuum chamber and um, remove as much air as I can, which reduces the pressure and causes the liquid to boil. And that also evacuates more air bubbles. The little air bubbles are a real pain if, uh, up there on the model when you cast. So after letting them set up for about two hours, I then remove uh, the base, the rubber base uh, from the bottom of these uh, flasks here and the sleeve around the outside. I have a big stock pot, dedicated stock pot that I place the flasks in there um, just above the water, boiling water, place the lid on it and steam them for about an hour. And you guessed it, an hour in, uh, in steam causes that wax to melt out. Um, probably 90% of the wax is evacuated in, during the steaming, I'm guessing that number. The flasks will remain in the kiln overnight uh, for a, like a 14 hour burnout cycle. Uh, when all that wax residue will get burned off. This is what it looks like at the heat highest point in the burnout cycle. You actually cast it when it's a little bit colder than this right here. All right, so now we're ready for casting. Uh, this is the next day, and I'm loading the crucible in the casting machine, um, which is already preheated, with some recycled silver from a previous cast. This is the uh, main sprue or the tree trunk that you saw earlier in wax uh, that has uh, been used in, in the cast before, and now I'm melting that back down. Uh, nothing's lost in this. You get to recycle all of your silver, which is nice. So the uh, casting machine uh, is a J2R NewTek and uh, the environment that's uh, in there where it's orange hot in there where it's melting the silver is bathed in nitrogen and an inert gas so that uh, oxygen won't mess with, uh, won't cause a whole bunch of problems, which it can do. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes less than 10 minutes to melt that metal down and uh, about uh, three minutes before that metal is melted, I remove the hot flask from the kiln, which is burned out overnight, and place it into the vacuum chamber. That uh, aluminum chamber there uh, has a vacuum hose attached to it. Place very carefully the flask in there, seal it up, open the vacuum. So I'm now drawing a, a vacuum in where that chamber is, and now I'm stirring the molten silver. I'm watching very carefully the temperature, and then I squeeze the handle, which drops the molten silver down through a hole in the bottom of the crucible into the flask. And this is what it looks like. I have a little extra uh, silver in there that's the extra orange on top. Um, turn the vacuum off right there and lift the pretty heavy flask out uh, of the vacuum uh, casting of the vacuum chamber and then let it sit for uh, about 10 minutes until the orange glow is gone and then I quench it in water. Once cool I can uh, inspect the tree and look for any uh, flaws or uh, things that didn't cast. Then when it comes clipping I'm going to remove the pieces from the main tree trunk there and after that, I inspect the rings very closely to see, uh, to call anyone's out that I don't think have any potential for, uh, for being uh, good finished products. So I can just melt those pieces back down. Um, then I begin the finishing process. Uh, I sand uh, the uh, rough sand, the initial sprue off of it. Next, I'll tumble finish the pieces for about 12 hours, which does help clean them up, polish them a little bit, and knock off any flash that uh, might be left behind from the, from the casting process. So after that, uh, if I'm dealing with rings, I'll often uh, round them out. Uh, when you're working in with the rings in the wax phase, they're generally in an oval shape, and uh, this tool right here um, will round the ring back out. It, it splays out and, uh, and, and rounds the piece very nicely. Nicely. Next, there's quite a bit of handwork at the bench to clean them up and do the final polish of the individual pieces. So here you have it. Uh, five rings made from five different textures that I collected. Uh, I've got three lichen rings, a fir bough, and a tree trunk of a palm tree. 
And I'm really happy with these designs. These are now been uh, polished and they're ready to go. So that's basically how you start with a, for example, a fur bow, a real fur bow, go to a mold, then go to wax, then go to investment and casting, and then finishing and polishing. So a lot of steps, uh, but you end up with some really cool stuff.